Although it's been common wisdom in technology and business circles for a while that disruption follows an S-curve, many people still don't know what this is, or even if they've seen it, what it means to their lives. Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. A special thanks to Rubix13, who's one of my patrons, for inspiring this episode. Thank you, cool idea. So here is a curve many of you probably know, many more of you have seen before but never really thought about very much, and yet more have never even really encountered. This is the classic S adoption curve for new things, which is often conflated with newer disruptive technology, though it doesn't have to actually be technology. For today, of course, we will talk about technology with this because that's what we're doing in this channel. But anyway, it doesn't have to be technology. So the two axes of the adoption curve are time on the horizontal and adoption rate on the vertical. So the adoption rate's pretty basic. It goes from zero to 100% because you can't have less than 0% penetration and you can't have more than 100%. So <laughs> that one's pretty easy. The time one's a little more flexible because you have to deal with the fact that time could be a month or a year or 10 years or 100 years. The shape of this curve means that new technology like, say, automobiles in the late 19th and early 20th centuries are adopted at first very, very slowly. So maybe rich people or adventurers or those who have a vision of the future, they kind of can see what's going to be happening later. So these people start the ball rolling. At the time, the tech is very expensive. The tech is very buggy. The tech fails a lot. And most people see this new thing as a toy or a boondoggle or something. So, right, they think, why would anybody want a smelly, stinky, loud, puttering automobile when we can ride Bessie the horse and <laughs> use her to help plow the fields at the same time? But there comes a tipping point. Somewhere around where the S-curve starts to get rather steep, the tech gets less expensive uh, because of economies of scale, if nothing else. The tech gets less buggy. In other words, it works most of the time. It fails less and more forward-thinking people start to say, hmm, this thing has more power than my horse, and it doesn't get cranky after a long day in the fields, and frankly, gas smells better than all the manure lying around in the streets. So why not give it a shot, right? And suddenly, after 15 or 20 years of only a few adventurous people driving around in cars, more and more people want one, and the more that want one, the cheaper and more reliable they get, and the cheaper and more reliable they get, the more people want one, and that's the kind of <laughs> progression that happens. Of course, there will be Luddites who still want to use their horses, but now they are the minority, and they're the backwards thinkers. So at first we had the minority, and they were the forwards thinkers, and then we went through the main part of the S-curve, and then we get to the tail end of the S-curve, which is the backwards thinkers instead. So in the case of the automobile again, in 10 years, from 1904 to 1914, New York City went from nearly all horses to nearly all automobiles. So that was 10 years. Now, it wasn't 10 years for the full curve. It was 10 years for the middle part of the curve there. And of course, for smaller towns and backwater areas, it followed the same adoption curve. It was just on a much, much longer time scale. We can also look at cell phones. In the 1980s, only rich doctors or lawyers had cell phones. In their cars, they were operated by the main car battery because they were so power hungry. They were super expensive. They were really buggy. They only worked in limited areas because each cell phone provider only provided a few cell towers. So it was, it was not that useful. But by the mid-1990s, nearly everybody in well-off countries had at least one cell phone per family. And by, you know, around the year 2000, nearly everybody had one for themselves, too. Or again, let's look at smartphones. In the early 2000s, the tech nerds had Palm Trios or other devices like that. Again, they were buggy, they were expensive, they were annoying, the screens were this big, they were tiny, they were difficult to use. And then in 2007, out came the iPhone. And in just four or five years, nearly everybody had either an iPhone or some sort of clone of that, like an Android phone, like a tablet phone in their pockets. It's, it's pretty amazing. It just went click, and all of a sudden, everybody had one of those. With each of these kinds of events and many, many more, including the internet, which was a biggie, the world changes radically from before till after the disruption. And the people who can see the fact and what's going to happen in the disruption at the beginning are the ones who are the early part of that adoption curve. And the ones who don't see that and maybe have, like, maybe they work in an industry that's being disrupted by this, those are the people who a lot of times are at the end of that curve. 
Let's talk about Tesla in just a moment, but first, if you enjoy this video, please do like it because YouTube's algorithm depends on that. And if you want to see more of these, please feel free to subscribe. That helps also. Also, a big shout out to my patrons on Patreon. It's been a wonderful journey so far. And particularly, I want to give a shout out to a new patron, Nick Lazarus, or maybe Lazarus. I think it's Lazarus. Anyway, thank you so much for subscribing. I appreciate it. Also, a big thank you to Zenly Music. You can check out his link in the description or just search Zenly Music in Instagram or YouTube. He's a wonderful artist and you should show him some love. And finally, if you're in the market for a new Tesla, make sure you check out a referral link. If you buy a car through that, we get a thousand free supercharger miles and you get a thousand free supercharger miles so cool so let's take another close look at this s adoption curve at the bottom of the s curve most people either don't know about or dismiss the new technology as unimportant or silly or expensive or useless or buggy etc but when the bottom of the tipping point is reached which is about where it goes kind of linear and turns into that 45 degree line society's mindset changes and it changes really, really fast. It seems faster and faster also the more recently these things have happened. It used to take 20 or 30 years and then it's been compressed down to 10 and now with like smartphones recently it happened in like four or five years. Now, of course, cars are very expensive items and people own them for a long time. So this is going to slow things down, but we can see where we are on this curve. We've gone through the, it's very expensive. It's very buggy. It's very only for rich people. It's niche. Or why would I give up my ice engine for this kind of thing stages, right? So we've gone through that bottom flat part of the S curve. At bottom, we are either at or very, very close to the tipping point where the line starts to go almost linear and goes up at 45 degrees. If you think about it in the news or just talking to people, more and more people in the general public are starting to think seriously about EV cars, and they're starting to think seriously about the shortcomings of ICE cars. This was something that you just didn't do when it was the only option, right? If you only have a, available an internal combustion engine, you just deal with the problems. But as you start to see a new technology that could be better, you're like, wait a second, why am I getting oil changed? I just spent $200 getting both of our cars oil changed. And I was so happy because I knew that our Mini we were going to sell and I would be getting a Model 3 and I would never have to get the oil changed for that car again. As Tesla and other manufacturers ramp up EV manufacture, there's no question that demand is going to outstrip supply for years to come. So the curve is going through that linear phase for, for several years at a pretty, pretty strong rate, like 45 degrees. So given this, two questions remain. Number one, what is the scale of the time axis? Are we talking about 10 years, 20 years, five years, who knows, right? And number two, what will full self-driving do to this curve? Ah. So for number one, my feeling for new car sales only is that the scale on the time axis is about 10 years. So by 2030, so I'm saying for the, for the linear part of this. So from now, 2020 to 2030, we're going to go through pretty much all of that linear phase and we're going to get up around 85 or 90% EV adoption by 2030. Of course, given the nature of automobiles, older ICE cars are going to be on the road for decades after that since they last so long. But it's going to become harder and harder to get gasoline. It's going to be harder and harder to get service because the fewer of them there are, the less the economies of scale work for it. And so it's going to become a difficult technology to own anymore. So most people are going to give it up eventually, except for special cases like collectors or people who own cars for movies, right? If you have a movie that's filmed in 2005, then you need ICE cars to drive around. But let's talk about point number two. Full self-driving is another disruptive technology that's happening on top of the EV adoption S-curve. So we've got two curves kind of on top of each other, and they're both more or less at the same point right now. So the tipping point for full self-driving is going to be when one or more companies gets broad regulatory approval to have their cars driving around autonomously. At that point, autonomous cars are going to rapidly expand to fill the market. But that market might be smaller than we think right now because people are going to see that hailing a robo taxi, which is very convenient and you can get within a couple of minutes, is far cheaper than owning a car. So fewer people are going to buy cars, so fewer cars need to be made, so economies of scale start to go away, and suddenly we hit the S-curve of full self-driving also, and we go up that 45-degree line there also. And that causes automobile sales to shrink. And if automobile sales shrink, that means it's a lot easier to manufacture the number of autos that need to be made. So we could shrink the time axis of EV adoption from 10 years down to five years, that middle part of it. 
So think for a moment back to before the internet or cell phones or before smartphones, if you're old enough for any of these things, and I am, so there you go. What was the world like before that? Can you, can you really imagine it anymore? I try to go back to the 1980s when I was in college and think about what life was like before like broad-based internet. I did have access to email and I would email my dad off of a mainframe computer or something, but it was super primitive. So I guess I was a super early adopter of the internet back in those days. But, but before you could do Google searches or go on Amazon and buy anything you wanted, it's, it's kind of hard to even imagine. And honestly, there's a question of would you go back to that time if you could because it would seem so primitive and difficult to live there. This exact thing is what could happen with cars in as little as 10 or even 5 years. We could think about it in 2030 or even 2027 or 28 and go like, man, how did I live back when I used to have to drive everywhere rather than being driven around and owning a car which took thousands and thousands of dollars a year to own? And this is why the S adoption curve is so important. In just a few years, our world could become something almost unrecognizable from the way it is today. And many businesses are going to be disrupted. Where are you going to be on this curve? Are you at the front of the S curve, the middle, the end? How's it going to affect your life in the next decade or so? How is life going to be different after the curve is over versus right now? These are things we all need to think about because it's happening. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Again, thanks to Rubik's 13 for inspiring it. Very interesting thoughts. Please do like and subscribe to the video if you enjoy this. And definitely ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye.